You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to another edition of Answers for the Family. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and for those of you that have been listening, sending in questions and comments, thank you so much, and please continue to help spread the word that every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific time, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases entertain, while bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. And you can all do me a huge favor. Please forward one of our shows to your social media group or to someone you know that can benefit from a particular show. Now, Answers for the Family will continue to address a variety of issues such as locating a runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and so much more. And we will introduce you to talented authors and new innovations in the areas of health, security, and sometimes fun for you and your family. Now our topic today is both emotional and controversial. And we're going to talk about the increase in mass shootings in America. And rather than sit back and watch many of our politicians use this subject to grandstand or gain political favor, we're going to talk with a world-renowned expert and get right to the point, which is what can we do to better protect our children and what can schools do to prevent and respond better to active shooters. Now our guest is Alon Stevie, and he is the CEO of Direct Measures International, a provider of security consulting, tactical training, and protective services for the private and public sectors. Alon is the founder and developer of ACT-CERT, which is an attack countermeasures training certification and online learning university, and the developer of the Mass Violence Prevention and Active Shooter Survival Course, the only training program of its kind certified and funded by the Department of Homeland Security. Now a little background, Uh, Alon immigrated to the U.S. from Israel after serving in an elite unit of the Israeli Defense Force. He has taught close combat tactics to the U.S. Navy SEALs instructors and has served as an advisor and trainer to federal, state, and local government since 1998. He is a post-certified law enforcement instructor and trains first responders through his Terrorism Responder Program. Alon is also certified by the Department of Justice in Dignitary Protection and has coordinated a broad spectrum of security programs and protective operations in over 30 countries having protected Fortune 500 executives, elected officials, and dignitaries such as the Israeli Prime Minister, Warren Buffett, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. He teaches university-accredited workshops on violence management and has been involved in the research of school security since 1999, having conducted audits and designed numerous security programs for schools, places of worship, and hospitals. Now, Alain is a member of the FBI InfraGuard and is a training advisor for the International Association of Counterterrorism and Security Professionals. He currently serves as a terrorism liaison officer and reserve deputy with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department's Criminal Intelligence Bureau. A true visionary and industry leader, Alon is a voice of common sense and practical security solutions. With his evidence-based and easy-to-understand style, Alon has empowered numerous people from all walks of life through his security education and terrorism countermeasures training programs. He's been featured on network television, radio, film, and many national print publications, and is fluent in English, French, and Hebrew. Alon, welcome to Answers for the Family. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure being here. Well, it's my pleasure. Uh, I was very thankful um, when our mutual friend introduced us. And I think he was right when he said, we need to know each other. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, one of the questions that is on the minds of many parents today, how safe are our children in today's turbulent world? You know, Alan, children and teenagers live in more complex lives than their parents did today. They're faced with new challenges and growing risks to their physical and mental well-being. The world perception of this digital generation is very dynamic and it's affected by the collective. As such, they're exposed to outside influences, like uh, this undermine the traditional family social support system effectiveness. And uh, over time, 
This can become a breeding ground for radical notions, self-alineation, and hostile view of the world and others. This is the age of information, where it's becoming increasingly difficult to stand out from the crowd. Information is at the core of our society, but it's also a powerful weapon. It can help educate and spread understanding and love, or it can spread hatred and, and fear. And fear is contagious and can make people do terrible things. As parents, we must remain involved in the flow of information with our children. They are much more connected and communicative than we ever were. And we need to understand this and make sure that we remain a central part of the conversation of their lives. We have to pay attention and make the time for it. You know, um, and for those that are just tuning in, uh, Alan and I were also interviewed recently as the guests on Sam's show. And, you know, Alon, we, we touched on a lot of different things, but one of the things that, that you mentioned had to do with, you know, the, the issues with mental health, you know, the areas that maybe we are not focusing on uh, to make sure that, that we're, we're not putting guns in these people's hands. So uh, share with us a little bit some of, some of your thoughts and the things that we can do uh, as a society to make some real change in this area. You know, as I was mentioning a bit earlier, everyone drives around the world with cars, and in order to get a car, you got to get a license, and you got to go through some testing, and you got to prove that you can drive it, and you cannot drive it under the influence, and there's a myriad of laws that govern who drives where and how we drive, right? And, and yet there's over 60,000 people that die per year from uh, automobile accident in, in the United States. So it's, it's a dangerous uh, thing, right, a car, but a weapon, a handgun or, or, or a rifle is not designed to do much more than actually to kill a human being. And there's not enough by comparison to car, no, nowhere nearly enough. The amount of scrutiny, background check, training, and to get someone a license to carry a gun. I'd say. So being able to conduct thorough mental health evaluation as a prerequisite for the ownership of a firearm I think is essential. As much as it is essential to make sure that no one with a felony or criminal background has access to a firearm. Well, I couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, and uh, you know what? We have we have a call coming in. Let me let me take this. For anybody that knows, they know that I'm. This is not usually my strength. So, um, hi caller, you're on the hi. air. You're talking with uh, Alan and Alan on Answers for the Family. And Hello. Yeah, hi. You're you're on the air. Do you have an, a, a question for our guest? Uh, I'm sorry. I think I called the wrong number. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, now, 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 there's about forty thousand people out there that <laughs> that know. Uh, have a great rest of the day. <laughs> Thank you. You just made mine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye. All right. Well, at the same time in which we had that call coming in, we also had a text question that, that comes in. Uh, this one's coming in from the Hacienda Heights, mm -hmm. and they ask, what should we do as parents? Uh, this person sa says that they're a parent of a high schooler and a middle schooler in dealing with the fear that their own children are now talking about when they go to school. Right, it's an important question, and it's important to talk about such fear in a logical context. You don't want to become an alarmist, and yet you want to keep the kids safe and thinking about s their own safety and security. So uh, talking about the threats in society, whether it's shooters at school or bullying or, for that matter, uh, a car crossing the road, right? Uh, we have to explain the facts of what the threat may look like, behave like, and then have the information and the knowledge that we teach uh, on what to do in the event that there is a shooter at school. And it's not rocket science, but you do need to know what to do and what never to do in order to survive. This is what uh, our program was designed to do, and uh, we teach it to school staff and faculty. It's also available to select students and, of course, to the parents as well. It's taught both 
uh, hands-on at mm-hmm. the schools as well as online at our website. Um, you know, we grow up as children from a very young age. We are taught that when we come across the road, we are going to look left and right and right and left and do it again mm-hmm. before we cross the road. And, and none of us is paranoid about it, right? We, we, we accepted this as a fact of life, right. as part of our living in modern society. We don't wake up in the morning feeling, oh my God, I'm gonna have to look left and right, right and left, and may get killed by a car today. We simply, as a matter of fact, do that many times per day. Well, in the same manner, we can teach each other how to look out for not just dangerous car, but dangerous people, and they are out there. Now, what is your thought on the way in which the media is handling this? Uh, and, and for instance, you know, the, the march of, of the many children. Uh, you know, I know on the one hand, I was glad to see that they are taking interest, but at the same time, is there a problem with the fact of going and, and saying, the only answer is just take all the guns away? And that seems to be one of the dialogues that we're getting from media. Um, how difficult can that be as far as causing more problems with the kids if they think that that's the only issue? You know, I, I admire the fact that people mobilize and join together, uh, even at a young age, to make a very important point that mm-hmm. needs to be made. Yeah. This issue needs to be brought to the forefront and become part of the m- main conversation in our country for internal safety and security of our nation. Sure. Uh, of our nation here, right? But I think that uh, removing all firearms is, number one, impractical, number two, uh, unfair, and number three, would actually undermine the safety of communities across the country because the criminals will never go to the gun store or apply with a background check for a license for a gun. They will steal it from those who have it or will simply buy it on a black market and then using against people that are unarmed and cannot protect themselves. So we have the right both constitutionally but as well as morally the obligation to protect ourselves and our loved one Mm -hmm. in our homes and in our communities and that right is the right to bear uh, arm and now naturally as I mentioned earlier this is a serious responsibility that cannot be taken lightly and has to be part of a process of scrutiny that is both the mental health aspect, the criminal background, and as well the capability to use a firearm safely no matter where you are when you want to buy one. Yeah, which actually I think uh, ties right into another question, um, which I think is very similar to that. Um, And this one comes in uh, from uh, North Carolina. This one says, uh, when I watch the news, they seem to think that setting up gun-free zones will solve the problem of gun violence. Is that true? I think you've just answered that. But it also says, what are the statistics behind, um, behind your answer uh, as to strictler gu- stricter gun laws in America? You know, I, we spoke about it a little bit earlier, Alan, and I think you know the answer to that as well. Uh, it statistically has been proven that uh, big cities like uh, Detroit and Chicago, for example, where firearms are... Uh, severely restricted from ownership in the hands of citizen, law-abiding citizen. Crime and violent crime at that, like murder, is actually on the rise and increasing. Yeah. Right? So yeah. that kind of answers the question in a very practical manner, right? We all see the news from Chicago almost on a weekly basis. Yep. And, uh, that's one of the underpinning problems there. No, and, and I couldn't agree more. And, and um and I think it's important to have, you know, statistics. You know, when, when people now are going on TV and throwing out these these thoughts or these ideas that they're having, but yet they have no viable statistics behind them that show why that would work or why that would make sense. So I think that's important, and I appreciate the person from North Carolina sending this question in. Yeah, you know, it, it's a noble notion, right? Yeah. The whole world disarm all at once. Yeah. And then we can all get along, and it'll never be at least gun violence, right? But it's just a notion because unfortunately those who are not all right and intend to harm others are not going to follow suit. And that means that all those that are good, all those that are law-abiding will remain vulnerable by comparison. And that's not right. No, I completely agree. Um, Now, and I know that that you have, you know, you, you have 
your own teachings. You have a certification program. Tell us a little bit about that, of some of the things that people can do to be able to get the training that they need that will help them be able to protect their own family. There are effective solutions today is to prevent mass violence. and uh, They can be basically categorized in two types. Okay? One is to uh, harden the school campus right, and from a security standpoint. And the second one is to engage people as active participants in their own security. Right? And, and they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Every school campus must undergo a comprehensive security audit that will identify all the vulnerability on a campus and recommend advanced security design and cost-effective technology solution to improve the security posture of the school. Right? Using principles that we teach in the security industry, like crime prevention to environmental design, for example, mm -hmm. you can make many schools much harder target. Right? For example, a, 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 an example of a crime prevention to environmental design in school will be uh, installing interconnecting doors between classrooms, right? Mm -hmm. Allowing people to evacuate the entire floor and the entire school without actually ever stepping out to the corridor, which is where usually the shooter roams, right? right. So if you are in a lockdown and the shooter is trying to b break into your classroom, uh, you have an option of escaping, even if you're on the second or the third or the fourth floor of a school. Uh, a lot of time, you know, people are remaining in classroom in a lockdown mode, which is a standard opening procedure in U.S. school for right. actually shooter, and are actually killed there, right? Because as you can imagine, uh, the shooter who goes to school, specifically if it's an internal threat, they know where everybody's at. They know the place, right? right. Whether it's school or workplace violence. They actually oftentimes have a hit list mm -hmm. of specific people they're looking to kill. And if you are locked down in that particular office or the classroom, that's where they're going to find you. Right. So as a generic uh, one-size-fits-all procedure, lockdown, in my opinion, doesn't serve us as good as it could. We should be able to, uh, people on, on the school campus, staff and faculty, should be able to and be trained to make the distinction and recognize if they can escape safely or if not, what to do in order to lock down. And when they lock down, they must know how to barricade. Because lockdown without barricading is self-entrapment. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So a lot of these can be taught as part of the engaging the people on site. The security can be improved uh, to what some of the measures that I mentioned. You can also and certainly need to reinforce the doors. Uh, I have some dead bolts. Some schools still just simply have a um, little lock on the handle, and that's that. That can be easily broken into and, and shut uh, and opened up. Like in Sandy Hook, right? Mm -hmm. they had uh, what they called at the time a secure lobby, quote-unquote, uh, that had two doors access, right, like a man trap. We, we do mm -hmm. use that concept in, in security. The problem was that the walls and the doors were made out of glass, Right, so they had a false sense of security that worked against, uh, you know, an average type person who's right. trying to have unauthorized access. Did not consider the possibility of an active shooter. The guy just shut his way straight through the glass and was inside the school in no time. And we know what happened as a result of that. School have to look at 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 security uh, of the campus in, following the principle of defense in depth. Defense in depth is creating rings of security, concerted rings of security, layers. The more layers, the more warning you have that a, a, some threat is coming in, and the more time you have to respond. You have to follow the five basic layers. The five Ds is what we teach. Okay. okay? Detect, uh, deter, deny, delay, and defend. Right. So you want to deter a potential intruder from even thinking about attacking your school because you have the appearance of vigilance, readiness, and some security measures that are visible. And then if that doesn't work, you want to detect them early enough, right at the school right. perimeter, or maybe even to social media in advance by collaboration between the student, the parents, and the teacher, to put out a warning to be careful and prepare for a potential attack. If that fails and the shooter is about to enter the, the school or the classroom, you have to be able to deny entry. That's mm -hmm. what I was talking a little bit earlier. Right. Right? Reinforcing the door, controlling the access control to the school. And if that fails and the shooter is roaming is inside the school, 
You have to be able to delay their movement in action. You know, on an average, in an active shooter incident, a person is killed every 10 seconds. Imagine that, right? Yeah. So every 10 seconds you delay a shooter, you're saving a life right. potentially, right? And then if the delay failed, and the shooter is making his way into the classroom or caught people in the open area like a cafeteria or the gym, you have to be able to defend yourself. That's the last D. Defend yourself with active measure instead of hiding under a desk mm -hmm. and simply being shot at point blank. So a lot can be done in school and a lot of it has to do with proper understanding of the challenges at hand and the education that goes with teaching both school staff and faculty, uh, the school district, as well as select student on what to do to prevent and respond to attack. Now, I, I, I couldn't agree more, and, uh, and I love the fact that you have broken it down in such a way that people can understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think now what we need, and we need everybody out there, everybody that's out there that is listening to this, uh, you need to go to your school and you need to tell them that these are the things that you need. Um, now share a, a little bit about, okay, so for those that want to get in touch with you, mm -hmm. okay, so, so let's say that you're a teacher out there, you're an administrator, uh, and you go, you know, why don't we have this in our school? Share how they can get in touch with you. All right, that's easy. They can find us online at uh, ACT ACTCERT.com, A-C-T-C-E-R-T.com, which stands for Attack Countermeasure Training Certification. That's the program that is uh, approved and funded by the Department of Homeland Security. We are happy to help any school district or school uh, principal out there and, and uh, even PTAs uh, on uh, how to improve the safety of the school and improve uh, the security posture of the school. Right. And when you say that it's funded by Homeland Security, so, so a school, and as, as we're sitting here in the San Fernando Valley and we can look out, we happen to look out over a high school, mm -hmm. okay? If at that high school, if, if they said, wow, we really need this, where are the funds coming from? Is Homeland Security actually funding it for them? Yes, yeah, so the Department of Homeland Security for DC, from the, the Washington, D.C. has approved the program for funding, and they send uh, the funding to the different states according to the right. needs of each state. In the case of California, the funding is handled by the California Office of Emergency Services in Sacramento, which then distribute the funds to the various areas of operation, the counties, so LA right. County, Orange County, Riverside County, and then each school within those county would have to apply for the grant, the fund money, to from the county administrator to receive the training and have it delivered at their school at no cost to them. That's how it works. All right, and uh, I mean, it sounds like that could take a long time, but I I, I think if if each school knows their procedure, it shouldn't take that long, right? Because it, because it, they're they're really only going to to their own county to or their, their own district. That's right, and saying we want this type of training. That's right, and the course is already approved and the curriculum is fully vetted, of course, So, and we're ready to go. It's a one-day course, it takes eight hours, okay, and we do four hours of lecture and, and, and education and training and videos and learning from lessons of the past, and then we spend four hours with school staff and faculty on school ground, on actual drill and practical exercise on how to evacuate from a shooter not fire, not earthquake, right. it's different. Shooter and an explosive or bomb as well. Mm -hmm. And then how to barricade rapidly and effectively in the classroom with whatever means are available in that classroom at the time. We teach a myriad, a myriad of different techniques and, and, and methods to barricade a classroom. And then how to evacuate not only uh, to the corridors but to alternate routes in case you cannot go to the corridor and then how do you reunify outside and find one another and account for one another and last but not least we teach last resort survival measure on how to stop the shooter at the door and disarm them and this is this is without weapon so mm -hmm. this is unarmed personnel of a school working together as a team in what i call collective resistance to survive Right, and again, for everybody out there listening, this is a this is a one day course, and it doesn't mean that. And, and Alan and I have talked about a lot of different things that we think can and should be done in the schools and changes that can be made. But this is something that can be done right now, and that's one of the things that we haven't seen. When something like this happens, it's splashed out there on the media for a week, and then 
they stop talking about it. And it, it's as if nothing is getting done. So this is something that can get done. It can be done right away. And at the same time, we can still focus on other changes. We can focus on being able to, to, to help the situation to, to get more funding to deal with, with uh, running better background checks or to, to you know, weed out people with mental health issues and stuff. So again, so for the teachers out there, and I know we have a lot of teachers, um, the teachers, go to your administrators and say, how do we get that funds for our school? Because it's not coming out of your budget, so it's a win-win situation. So get on it. And the same thing with parents. Um, I know that if my kids were still in, you know, in school, in middle school or high school, hey, I'd, say, I'd be right there in the administrator's office tomorrow saying, why don't we have this for our school? It's not coming out of our budget. It's a win-win situation. You know, Alan, I think a lot of people are, are still somewhat, somewhat, not as much as they used to be, but somewhat in denial about the seriousness and the size of the problem, right? I mean, we have this mass shooting that keep occurring on a regular basis right, across the country. So, Well, you touched on something earlier in the earlier show, so for those that didn't hear it, we were talking about the mass shootings, and what you had said was, well, that's of the ones that we know of, and that's of the ones in which they didn't catch them before it happened. That's right. So it doesn't mean that it isn't a bigger issue. It just means that when they catch them ahead of time, there's not a lot of publicity on that. You know, it's the, it's the old, you know, if it bleeds, it reads. Mm -hmm. Media doesn't jump all over the fact that says, hey, you know, teachers and law enforcement did a great job of figuring out what was going to happen before anybody got hurt. And, and prevented the attack from and occurring. And prevented it yeah. from every attack. It, it's a small mention in the newspaper somewhere, but that's about it. Yeah. A lot of peop good people are hard at work yeah. at preventing this attack to start with. But there is still always going to be some that are going to go to the crack, right? And, and, and as a society, we live in a 911 society where we expect help to always be a phone call away. Right? This approach has repeatedly failed and does not work during critical incident. We need to think about the recurring threat of mass violence differently and if we expect different results. Violence in society is increasing and there is no one-stop gap measures or silver bullet to solve this problem. It's a complex challenge that requires the engagement of all stakeholders, including parents, staff, faculty, and students, as well as law enforcement, working together to change the status quo. And it's important to understand why it yeah. happened. Right? It's important to know if it's a, if it's a mental health issue, if it's the prevalence of fire in the society, if it's the ex overexposure to violent video content of, of the young generation. It's all important and that may help us eventually reduce the size of the problem and perhaps eliminate it someday. But that's not soon enough. Right. People are dying on a regular basis all the time. Those tragedy are horrible and there's no need or reason for that. There are things we can do now to make a difference, okay? We've learned the same lesson from all mass shooting incidents uh, uh, to date, that most casualty occur within the first 10 minutes of the attack prior to law enforcement inter intervention. It's always the same. That's what happened in Columbine, right. in Virginia Tech, in Sandy Hook, and in Parkland, and many others mass shooting. Help is on its way, but rarely arrives on time to make a difference. So the conclusion is very simple, right? If you think about it logically, mm -hmm. and it keeps happening, expecting law enforcement to respond immediately is unrealistic. And relying solely on outside assistance is ineffective. The solution is truly self-evident. We must be prepared to protect ourselves until help arrives. Self-reliance is key to survival. All right. We are talking with Alan Stevie and he is the CEO of Direct Measures International as well as uh, other organizations. Uh, if you want to follow along with us, we're going to take a break in a minute, but if you want to follow along with us, you can go to uh, www.actcert.com, that's A-C-T-C-E-R-T.com, or you can go to directmeasures.com. Uh, if you go there, you can follow along with us. Obviously, if you're driving, don't try this. Uh, but uh, we're going to take a break. We will be right back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, 
Westfield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full-service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Uh, our guest is Alon Stevie, and we are talking about a very difficult subject, which is the mass shootings that have been occurring in our country. Uh, Alon, uh, one of the things that, that I'd like for us to touch on is the psychological effect. Um, I think that most people, and we all wish that we never have to go through anything like this, we certainly don't want our children to ever go through something like this, but talk a little bit about the psychological things that happen in a human being when they're confronted with this situation. You know, Alan, that's a great question. You, you know, we, we're all the same. Good guy and bad guys. At the end of the day, comes out to the same thing. Two eyes, two hands, two legs, one brain, right? And we function very much alike. Uh, and when you don't know what to do and what to expect, you panic. And when we panic, we freeze. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that happens to the body so much as in the mind, right? The, our body doesn't move one inch unless the mind tells it to do so, okay? So the freezing, this phenomenon like the deer in the headlight, right, mm -hmm. occurs in our mind. And so you have to, and it happens again and again when you don't know what to do. So we, we looked at this. We've been studying it, this for years. And there was a, a, a person named uh, Colonel Boyd. Right, Air Force Colonel, many many years ago, was a Top Gun fighter pilot, right, in Vietnam era, who was appointed by the Air Force, U.S. Air Force, to develop a training method for uh, our fighter pilots, right? So, so because our fighter pilot at the time were keep, keep shooting each other down in dogfights in the air and all missing the enemy and not performing as good as they could. So, Colonel Boy was a very pragmatic guy. Uh, done extensive study and practice and training and he developed this acronym known as ODA O O D A and 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 the ODA acronym is what we in the tactical world law enforcement and security and military world live and die by right ODA describe the way the brain works under duress and the first thing that we always do is observe right mm -hmm. we, we we look at what it is that we are faced with is it one threat two threat is it armed with a gun, with a knife? Is it uh, a man, a woman? Right. And then the first, second thing that we do uh, uh, with that information is orient. It's a military term, right? Term, right? Orient. Mm -hmm. uh, orient means where is the threat in relation to my current position? Is it ahead of me, behind me, above me, below me, on my right, on my left? Right? Or, as you can imagine, fighter pilot have to deal with that very quickly, right? Sure. And, and only after we've observed and oriented, we can make a decision about what to do about it. Right, mm -hmm. and and only after we decide, we can act effectively if we know what to do. Well, this order loop, order cycle takes time, and and if people don't know what to look for, how to recognize a threat, how to relate that threat to what is about to happen to them, they can't make a decision of what to do about it. So that's the first part. The second part is most people don't know what to decide right. when they're faced with a threat. And then they don't act. And here's your freeze phenomenon. Here's the right. deal. And they're like, you don't act. You just stand there and you end up becoming a victim. Mm -hmm. Learning how to go to the order real quick. Mm -hmm. Discerning what the threat is, where it's coming from, and deciding what to do. And the decision is really always the same. Okay, It's pretty simple in a situation like that. Flight or fight. Disengage or engage. 
stay or go if it's a school, right, yeah. right, right. And and once that decision is made, and you know what to do if you have to stay, and you've been trained on how to fight for survival if you have to, or how to barricade your classroom if you have to, then you have option. You're no longer a deer in the headlight. This is something that we teach. It's very easy to understand, and it applies, like I said, both ways to good guys and bad guys. So imagine now the bad guy, the shooter, coming through a doorway into a classroom with a gun in front of his face looking for someone to kill. He's in a situation that we call target fixated or tunnel vision. He sees the world in a very small narrow circle in front of his face to the barrel of his gun. He does not see anything onto the right or the left of him or below or above, right? And if you are properly positioned and you are ready and the light is turned off, uh, 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 you can stop him without him even knowing that you are there and take him down within less than two seconds and control the problem on the ground after that. That's the type of concept and principle that Everybody can learn in school. We teach it. We taught it to uh, people from all walks of life, men and women, okay? Mm -hmm. And they are empowered by not only knowing this, but also by practicing it hands-on with us. I mean, we've had teachers repeatedly ask us to keep bringing the perpetrator, role players, so they can do it again doing the exercises. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you make a great point because we practice, I mean, every school that I've ever been, and I was also a room dad, so even as an adult, mm -hmm. We practice fire drills, but you know what? I've never, <laughs> I've never seen where there was a fire. I mean, I've never been involved mm -hmm. in one, and uh, and I, my kids weren't. Uh, and and at least if there have been many school fires, it's certainly not getting the publicity that this is. Why is it that we're not practicing? this exactly when there is so much more at risk absolutely there is more uh, incidents of violence in school than fires hands down i mean there used to be fires in 20 30 years ago and that's why they've established all the fire codes for school mm -hmm. and public building which is a necessary thing to do but the actual uh, fire haven't occurred that I know of quite a while in the school, and yet we practice the school practice it several times per year yep. and 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 they are not spending enough time or resources practicing and preparing for the potential threat of violence on the campus. Well, uh, fortunately with your course, I think we can change that. So let's talk about some of the other things that, that can be done. Uh, I, I know you talked a little bit about the one-day course, um, but what are some of the examples within the course of, of what the students learn during that course? Oh, that, that's a great question. I mean, it's a combination of things, right? We, we're focusing on two things. I, I figured since we are able to teach how to respond to a threat, we might as well use the platform to teach how to prevent the threat from happening in the first place, right? So the course, in the course we teach how to improve security uh, all around campus, uh, and, and then we teach how to recognize early warning sign of an attack, particularly recognize behavioral indicators of dangers, right? There are always warning signs that are oftentimes misunderstood or ignored, just like in the case with Parkland. Here, yes. right, right, right. So we teach school staff and faculty, as well as the parents who wants to learn about it on our website and uh, uh, community leaders like mm -hmm. uh, in the church or the synagogue to recognize behavioral anomalies, patterns, changes of behavior in a person's uh, who's exhibiting them who is a student, right? Because these things don't occur pop out of nowhere. It's a process of evolution. Violence is a process of evolution. It takes time for the human mind to get to that point where they become that violent. It's not difficult if you're paying attention and you know what to look for to recognize, hey, there's some signs here that are indicative that the person is not okay, that mm -hmm. the person has suicidal tendency, that the person is thinking violent thoughts, making some threats. And you know, those signs are not exhibited all at once uh, to one person. They are exhibited over time to perhaps a, a group of different people in the school ground, right? So if you uh, are the, the coach at the gym and you notice that, you know, Johnny makes a comment about, oh, I'm tired of this place and one day, one day I'm gonna shoot down something about it. And then you're the math teacher and you hear another comment about, I think these guys in Columbine did the right thing because everybody deserved it. And then the math teacher 
speaks to the coach or there is a method or a mechanism for them to share that information, right. now we have some credible indicator that doesn't say we have to go arrest Johnny. No, it, it says, let's go talk to him. Yeah. Let's go visit the house. Let's talk to the parents. Is everything is okay. It's a lot easier to prevent than to respond. Right, and, and, and focus on help. Yeah, you know, if, right. if we can go in and we can offer some, some therapy or something like that. That's right, um, intervention, and, yep. And, and your thing in regards to everybody communicating is huge, and Parkland is the perfect example of that. Mm -hmm because here we had a situation in which there were 30 times in which the police had been called to come out to the house. There were two times in which somebody had contacted the FBI. Even, even the boy himself had called in on himself saying that he <laughs> was depressed after his mother died. Yeah. Um, you know, so all of these things, you know, it had, had somebody tied all of this information together, if there was a mechanism to be able to say, look, we're going to put all this together, it was pretty obvious that something was going to happen. They just weren't communicating. That's right, it fell to the crack. And you said it, there is no one mechanism that gathered all this information and, and disseminated and shared it in a timely manner to the stakeholder. Um, I'm, I'm working on something very special. What if there was a cost-effective way to engage all stakeholders? What if we were able to put everyone on a single platform to collaborate in order to prevent and respond to school emergencies. Putting the student, the parents, the staff, the faculty, and the first responder, all working together to make school safer. Well, there is such a platform. I'm working right now on an initiative. We're putting together a nonprofit initiative, combining best practices in security planning and training with leading edge technology, mobile technology, to create the ultimate sustainable school safety solution and inspire students to live life free of fear. It's part of my other uh, uh, co company called GoWare. Yeah, I, and, and I was looking up some of that. In fact, I'm glad that you brought that up because I was going to, to ask you about it. One of the things as I was looking into it that I loved was the fact that it, it delivers real time. It, it delivers actionable information in real time. Right, right. Okay, that to me is huge because I started to envision, because I've heard other people talk about gathering information, and having one giant warehouse of information just becomes another bureaucratic mess mm -hmm. but something that is real time and immediately actionable I think is exactly what we need so yeah, I love it's relevant the information yeah. has to be relevant in exactly. order to be practical <laughs> and useful particularly in incident like this right I mean as I mentioned earlier most casualty occur within the first 10 minutes prior to law enforcement intervention and the reason why law enforcement intervention is oftentimes delay is because they don't have a common operational picture or what we call COP, COP, of what is going on, where the shooter is, how, where are the, the, the victims, where are the students hiding or running away. You know, when you go into a school and you come in with a high power rifle or even with a handgun, you discharge your firearm, that bullet's gonna travel for a mile. And, and you, you can't see through walls, right? So some of the school's walls are made out of drywall. That bullet will travel through them multiple times and could hit somebody that's totally out of your line of sight. So it's very important and imperative for first responder who wants to get in and do uh, save a life, right? They're willing to put their life on the line to do that, to have a common operational picture. This system that we're working on will provide that, a situational awareness that has never been available and existed prior. And, and it's, it, we're doing that by combining and integrating technology, leading a technology, and the subject matter expertise that we have in our team in security, counterterrorism, active shooter prevention, and things like that. It's a really unique project. It's an initiative. Well, again, I, you know, I can only hope that our, <laughs> our political leaders are listening. Uh, and again, so for everybody out there when you, if, you know, that is listening, help spread the word. Uh, if you're watching this on uh, Facebook Live, share it with somebody that you know. I, I know from my standpoint, I've got a few congressmen and senators that I'm tied to through either Facebook or LinkedIn. I'm going to make sure that I share it with them because these are the things that, that we need to do. And we need to do it now, not the fact that you know wait until it happens again and then everybody gets, gets excited for a week or two while it's on the headlines and then it seems like nothing gets done. And it will. It will happen again, unfortunately. And I've said it so many times again and again, and every time I was proven right. And it's sad to me, and it also makes me upset every time it happened because I know that something could have been done to prevent it and or uh, increase the survival rate of the people on, the, on site, right? So we have to come to terms with this. We have to work together. It has nothing to do with politics. 
It has to do with saving lives. And it's not, we're not talking about expensive stuff here. We're talking about cost effective. A, a few dollars per student in a school yeah. can make that happen. Right. Yeah. Now, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, I know that you have set it up, and it's you know we've talked a lot about as it relates to schools. Um, what about taking these same skills? Share a little bit how it will save lives in other situations, such as like a movie theater, for example. You know, that's that's a great question. Mass shooting continues to occur not only in school, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. I mean, we had the uh, shooting in Mandalay Bay, horrific. Right. Was in uh, U.S. history, we've had uh, shooting in uh, in the Paris Bataclan concert hall, yeah. right? That, that's it. And and of course, the movie theater in Aurora in Colorado, yeah. if you remember, a few right. years back. Um, it, the principle that I spoke about on how to counter a shooter at a close range remains the same and apply. Mm -hmm. So, for, for example, let's just take Aurora, for example. That shooter dressed up like a SWAT team member. He had a helmet on. He had a gas mask on with goggles, right? He was all wearing black with a high-power rifle. He came to the side door uh, in the middle of the you know, screening of the movie, Batman, I believe, and, and he started shooting people in the front row, right? Now, but imagine yourself, put yourself, if you could, in the shoe of the shooter, and what is it that you're seeing at that point? You have goggles on. You sink to like a scuba diving mask, right? A gas mask is like that. And you're looking straight ahead down the barrel because that's how you aim a mm -hmm. firearm, right? You get to look down the barrel, right? That means, and, it, and the theater was dark, really dark. That means he's not seeing anybody on the side, right? People could have gotten up from the side and a few feet away and rush him and push his gun down and take him down and just contain him on the floor in the dark he would have never known what hit him and the shooting would have been stopped within seconds instead people did not know what to do so they did what a lot of people don't know what to do we discussed it earlier uh do and that's freeze they panic and they try to hide freeze or duck yeah yeah duck duck uh, under the chairs in a the movie theater the last time i looked chairs in movie theater are not bulletproof Right. And unfortunately, that's where they die. You know, in most shooting incidents in the workplace or at school, people are found shot to death under the desk. Why? Because this is the standard mode of response or operation for most people who don't know what they do. It's so much so that, you know, some of those should have filmed themselves as a manifesto mm -hmm. in, in a video prior to doing the whole if you're uh, crime, and then they, you know they, they they make those video available after the death of the time. Well, we've seen a lot of those videos. In several of them, the shooter are seen practicing shooting on their own prior to the shooting at uh, an open field somewhere or at a range. And you know how they practice, Alan? They practice shooting tennis balls on the floor, right? Imagine that, right? So, what does that show you? It shows you that what they expect to they expect find. them to be right. on the floor. Yes, you cannot expect the unexpected as a shooter you totally focus if we work together with surprise as a team we have a numerical advantage we can take the shooter down we can hold them on the floor and when you're on the floor that firearm is not as effective nowhere nearly as effective than when you aim it to someone's head you know you you mentioned something in regards to them filming themselves mm -hmm. and uh, this is a uh, it's, it's something that I had brought up uh, another time talking about this and that is this idea that they're going down in uh, infamy you know this idea that they're going to be famous this idea that the media is going to make them this big star or whatever um, I, taking a a different subject but you know many years ago there would they started to have an issue with people and sometimes streakers that would run on to sports games they would mm -hmm. run onto the field, either baseball or football or something. They would run onto the field. Well, all of the cameras went on them, and then it started happening. All you know, th then it happened a lot right. when it happened. So one of my thoughts is, let's quit talking about them. Let's refer to them as, you know, the dumb shit or whatever. Let's mm -hmm. not refer to them by name. Mm -hmm. Let's not put their face on anything. Nothing. They get zero publicity from this action and I think that will make a difference as well. It, it will have an impact and I'll tell you th uh, why I say so. Uh, th 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 there was actually an interesting phenomenon. I believe it happened in uh, I want to say uh, Germany or Norway where there was a streak a few years back a streak of people 
committing suicide by jumping in front of a railroad uh, train, right, in, at the metro station or the subway station. And every time that there was such thing happening, there was major publicity in the newspaper telling the story of the person mm -hmm. and why they felt compelled to do something like that. And, and it keeps happening again and again. It kept happening, keep happening. And then the chief of police and the mayor got together and they decided, okay, no more newspaper coverage. Yeah. A little mention in a back page. Within a month, the suicide stopped. There you go. There is a phenomenon associated with having that notoriety to publicity that is playing a factor in the psyche of those, you know, uh, violent, you know, shooters. Mm -hmm. Uh, we don't call them by name anymore. It used yeah. to be that they, they, you know, they were details of their lives and name were mentioned over the media. The media have learned, I think, not to refer to them by name or give them too much publicity that way. But we still spend too much time in trying to understand why they've done this and get into all the details and the reason. Like I said, it's important to prevent yeah. it on the long run. Right. But immediately we need to focus and the media should be talking a lot more about what we can do to prevent it and how we can survive the next one well again we're talking with alan stevie and uh, again for those out there if you want to go to his website you can go to directmeasures.com uh, he also has safetyforstudents.org and if you're out there driving obviously you can't write this down go to our site answersforthefamily.com we will have all of alan's information there alan thank you so much i cannot believe that we are out of time already um I look forward to working with you on this stuff, and again, for everybody out there, um, talk to somebody that can make the decisions. Let's get more education on this subject. Alon, thank you, Alan. Thank, thank you. you very much. It's been a pleasure, and stay safe out there. Thank you. All right. Now, for everybody out there, please be sure to put us on your calendar and tune in next Monday when our guest will be Mona Treadway, co-owner of Dragonfly Transitions. And Mona will join us to discuss what young adults identify as key factors that support growth and change in their transition. And please visit our archives of past interviews at AnswersForTheFamily.com or you can subscribe to the show through iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube. Uh, and once you do that, the show will get sent to you uh, a couple hours after we record it. Uh, if you like what you hear, please leave a review. It will help us reach more people and be greatly appreciated. And the next time you're on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page. Check out some of our latest posts. If you like them, please like us and share. Uh, we're now going to be doing more of these on Facebook Live. Please share with loved ones and other people in your social media. Be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on L.A. Talk Radio.